Hello, I'm Hannah Wallen, host of HBR Talk and all around meddler and things political. And I'm going to talk today about reproductive rights and the accountability gap. Women just can't catch a break, you know? I mean, we've been hearing about the wage gap myth for so long I'm afraid to walk around at work in case I might fall into it. And we thought we had a cure for that in 2009 when the CONSAD report came out and proved that the bulk of it could be attributed to women's choices. Make different choices, get different results. Imagine the power. Women could have closed that gap all along. So, of course, right away, feminists, they, uh, well... <laughs> They found new ways to make the claim that women are paid 79 cents for every dollar a man gets paid for the same work. They decided work didn't even have to be the same in order to be called the same. Seriously, by 2016, they were trying to bolster their argument by implying that housework should be factored into the concept of equal work when considering what constitutes fair compensation for on-the-job labor. The fact that this work has nothing to do with the employer doesn't bother them as long as factoring it in at least creates some illusion that uh, the same work claim is defensible. Well, that's helpful, isn't it? Problem solved. No, not the problem of women earning less money than men. The really important problem of feminists losing a gender issue they'd been complaining about. Of course, no one would go with such a stupid argument, right? I mean, everybody knows that workplace compensation is for work assigned to you by your employer, right? It was wage gap myth creep that led me to recognize a largely invisible factor in men's issues that lies under every area of disadvantage that men and boys face. There is no wage gap, but feminists are able to hold on to their myth because of another gap, one they'd never admit exists. In the men's rights movement, we discuss the underlying causes of most issues in terms of gynocentrism and male disposability. Gynocentrism is a dominant or exclusive focus on women in theory or practice, leading to prioritization of female interests. Male disposability is the sidelining of men's welfare when it comes into contact with women's interests. We see these combined to result in law and policy that discriminates against men and boys for the purported benefit of women and girls. Between these two factors, our society measures the benefits, drawbacks, morality, and even the ethics of everything by how it affects women. Men are rarely given consideration, and when they are, it's in the context of how their loss or disadvantage affects women, or how the thing under discussion isn't so bad because, after all, it affects both sexes. Remember those old when-you-see-it memes? This is the when-you-see-it of men's issues. Pick one, any men's issue. Look behind it. Now look behind male disposability. Look behind gynocentrism. See that huge gaping hole in the human psyche? That's the accountability gap. This is Attitude Zero, a gender disparity in societal expectations for personal accountability for the consequences of one's own choices. Every justification for anti-male discriminatory law and policy relies on this double standard. There's a workplace death gap because women are not as accountable as men for maintaining our society's standard of living, much less that of their own families. Women can, without shame, choose safer jobs or choose not to take all of the risks involved in the jobs they've chosen, or for that matter, choose not to seek employment at all. There's a gender disparity in criminal court because women are less accountable than men are for their criminal actions. 
In fact, a woman's accountability in criminal court is often mitigated by the degree to which she can transfer responsibility for her choices to a male scapegoat, even if he is the victim of her crime. The wage gap myth persists because our society does not hold women accountable for the life balance impacting consequences of their sexual choices, and most women are pretty content with that. That issue is not alone. That aspect of the accountability gap is the hole into which a man's due process rights will be tossed if a woman accuses him of sexual misconduct. It's the hole into which his bodily autonomy rights will be tossed if he is the accuser and she is the accused. It's the rock his parental rights will get pinned under if he's an unmarried or divorced father seeking any custody rights at all. They'll be held there right alongside the mother's financial responsibility for her family. This is an underlying factor in women's issues, too. Why are there so few female CEOs? Because when women make less responsible workplace choices, everyone makes excuses for them. And if you don't, you get called a misogynist. How does that encourage self-improvement? How can one strive for excellence if one isn't allowed to know the difference between excellence and mediocrity? This gap is one of the most fundamental, one of the most egregious glitches in the way our society views the human condition. A rarely noticed filter that allows our society to maintain a massive set of double standards. With this in mind, let's dive into the topic of reproductive rights. I once knew a girl who found herself the target of a lesser known cryptid, a creature whose existence has been described and possibly even investigated but remains unsubstantiated. The effects of the attack were profound, dramatic, and life-changing. It started with bizarre food cravings. Fatigue began to creep in along with unusual clumsiness, and she began to experience frequent bouts of nausea. Soon she was experiencing mood swings, massive swelling, anatomical changes, and a socially crippling sense of self-consciousness as the people around her began to react to her condition. Eventually she had to be hospitalized for special treatment, removal of an unexplained massive growth, and by the time she returned home, she had come to realize that her life would never be the same. To this day, she still has no idea what triggered this bizarre series of events. This sent me on a long, wandering investigation. Since then, I've witnessed numerous encounters and their consequences. Victims come from all walks of life, every national origin, religion, and creed. They can range from adolescent to middle age and occasionally even those old enough to retire from work are affected. These unsuspecting targets go about their daily lives without any concern for the monster lurking within their midst, until one day without warning and through no actions of their own, they become its next target. The only thing they have in common is that they are all female. In 2017, I began the long, arduous campaign to raise awareness of this widely experienced, extremely serious, but little understood women's issue. Its main cause has been so ignored by society that to date, nobody else seems to even be aware of it. Yet it touches the lives of millions of women around the world every year. All of you have seen the effects of this insidious evil, and yet you probably don't even realize it why your very existence may even be a result of such an encounter. What am I talking about, you ask? No less than the most dangerous creature on the planet. Horror of the Hallowed Hallway, Stalker of the Sacred Slit, the Terror of Tuna Town, Fear the Unstoppable Power of the Knockup Fairy. You may laugh. But beware of underestimating the damage that can be done by this creepy little varmint. Too many women today sincerely believe that their bodies are entirely under their own control. After all, we have rights, don't we? We have girl power. We can fight this. Good luck with that. Nothing could be sneakier than this little freak, silently gliding closer as its target goes about her daily life with no understanding of the level of risk she takes every time she fails to notice its sinister presence. One minute, she's just out for an innocent walk to the store, and the next, bam, stricken by the sprite's ominous curse. 
According to my observations, there appears to be nothing, absolutely nothing she can do to avoid this terrible, unnatural fate. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and yet no one seems to be willing to examine or even talk about this widespread phenomenon. At this rate, we will never be able to figure out a way to stem the tide of its prolific influence. God help us all, because everyone knows, as women, we just can't help ourselves, right? Reproductive rights have been so long and so widely viewed as a women's interest that it often gets deemed offensive, even misogynistic, to discuss them in terms of men's and children's interests. Why do we have to fight so hard for equal legal standards in this area, and why do women so often respond to discussion of it as if we've just jumped out of their closets and threatened to devour their souls? Really, what do they have to lose? Feminists like to start the discussion in the middle by railing about abortion, but the near-exclusivity of women's reproductive autonomy starts much earlier. Seriously, we might as well just label consent the social territory of women. For those who don't believe me, let's compare a couple of similar stories. Most people in the U.S. remember the Brock Turner case because we've heard the feminist side of it ad nauseum for the last five years. According to news reports, Turner attempted to digitally penetrate an unconscious woman. She had accompanied him into an alley on the way to his dorm before passing out. According to his testimony, she had been conscious and an active participant in the beginning, and he had not noticed when she passed out. In a speech at the 2014 Gloria Awards, feminist comedian Amy Schumer detailed an experience from her college days. According to her own statement, while sober, she chose to have penetrative sex with a man who was so stinking, stumbling, drunk, he couldn't maintain an erection or consciousness. She bragged about it. She was so proud of how she'd recovered her self-esteem after the incident that she wanted everybody to know. The judge in Brock Turner's case said he believed Turner's testimony about having received consent but the jury convicted him on three counts of sexual assault. He was sentenced to be listed on the sex offender registry and serve six months in jail. Feminists protested that this was not enough and successfully campaigned to have the judge removed from the bench. When Turner was released after serving only half of his sentence, protesters marched in his residential neighborhood open carrying guns that people on their side of the political fence usually claim that nobody should be able to legally possess. They were obviously quite incensed about the situation and intended to be intimidating in response. So, what was the response to Schumer's speech? Looks like territory under female control to me. But hey, at least there's birth control, right? Men have condoms, 99% effective at preventing pregnancy when used correctly. Well, what do women have? There's condoms just for women, sponges, foam and film, and diaphragms that you can use with spermicides or pills, shots and IUDs, and there are even long-term options like the implant next plan on. So gals, do you think that you can learn a birth control plan given all the choices that you have before you are? Are you such a loser? You can't be a chooser. Come on ladies, be better than that. So you can't really call women helpless to control their fertility. But since men also have an option, they're equally protected, right?
Well, except when women use birth control sabotage. In some countries, if a man does this, he can be considered guilty of rape, even if he does it with his own condoms. Women face no legal repercussions for the same behavior. A woman who has done this can even collect child support from the unwilling father. Even if she were to rape him, if a child is conceived and she retains custody, she could collect child support from her victim. He will still be stigmatized as a deadbeat if he rejects parental status in any way. In the U.S., there have been child support obligations imposed on men and underage boys, some too young to hold a job under such circumstances. It's really hard to argue that women are helpless in this area. anti knock -up fairy shields are everywhere, and a woman's entitlement to them is protected, while there are no consequences if a woman interferes with a man's ability to control his fertility. But let's just say a woman didn't know all of that until she got pregnant and now it's too late. Guess she's really screwed, huh? Totally out of options. Oh wait, I forgot about abortion pills, which can be used up to 11 weeks into a pregnancy to cause a miscarriage. Then there's surgical abortion in which the fetus is killed and removed. In the U.S., over half a million women a year abort pregnancies, with approximately two abortions for every ten live births. This decision is hers, and hers alone. The father has no legal recourse to make her take this option or to stop her if this is what she chooses to do. He can be stigmatized as an abuser if he pressures her in either direction, or even if he refuses to pay for an abortion to which he has ethical objections. Side note here, this social standard does get used in a type of scam in the U.S. The scammer fakes pregnancy after having sex with her mark. She says she wants to have an abortion, but she doesn't have the fee or insurance coverage for it. And hey, I ain't saying she's a gold digger, but does he want to be on the hook for 65% of his gross pay every payday for the next 18 years? A one-time payment of the abortion fee, about $500 on average. Seems like a bargain by comparison, right? Except she's not pregnant. She's just trying to shake him down for $500 under the threat of a much more expensive gamble. She knows that since most abortion clinics maintain anonymity for their patients, it'd be hard as hell for him to prove that she didn't have an abortion. But, aha, you can demand proof of pregnancy in the form of a test before paying, right? Best bet? Avoid this risk altogether by not consenting to sex with a woman you don't fully trust. But if you're ever suspicious after being asked to pay for an abortion, your next best bet is this. Don't give her any money. Be the caring, sympathetic guy who wants to see her through this tough time. Be comforting and sincere. Even if, on the inside, you're feeling hurt, angry, or betrayed. Put on an act and do this. Go with her to the clinic. Pay the fee directly, wait for the procedure to be done, and then drive her to the home of whatever friend or family member is going to help her with her aftercare. You'll soon know whether she's actually pregnant because if she isn't, she won't go along with that. She'll make threats, cuss you out, accuse you of all kinds of misogyny, all while continuing to demand that you just hand over the money. At that point, she has just handed you the ammunition you need to become suspicious and demand evidence that cannot be sabotaged. If she does go through with it, you just come out of it being the good guy who helped that poor, unfortunate, knock-up fairy-stricken woman through a tough time that you otherwise had zero control over. And now you know exactly how careless, irresponsible, mercenary, and selfish this woman really is. What a catch, right? Anyway, it's kind of hard to argue that in the face of even an existing pregnancy, a woman is helpless. But what about women with moral or ethical objections to abortion? They have no options, right? It's not like they can agree to marry you and raise the child in a unified household. I mean, who does that, right? Okay, well, what if marriage is off the table? Depending on where you live, there are other options. Joint custody, shared parenting, equally shared parenting. 
Or what about relinquishing sole custody to the father? She can have all the freedom feminists claim non-custodial fathers have. Easy peasy. Okay, so women complain about all levels of paternal custody, but it sure is hard to argue that when there's a father who chooses to be involved, the mother is somehow stuck with sole custody against her will. In fact, no matter how involved the father wants to be, if custody is contested, the court is predisposed to favor the mother. So, this is yet another area where she has more control than he has. Of course, if the father doesn't want to be involved, then the mother is really out of luck, right? She has no choice but to take on all of the responsibility herself. Oh wait, I forgot about adoption. There's an option that would relieve both parents of all responsibility, should they so choose. Of course, her ability to legally do that does rely entirely on his cooperation, right? What if the mother just can't bring herself to go through that process, or she has no cooperation from the father and can't get to Utah? There's this thing called safe haven abandonment. What is safe haven abandonment, you may ask? That is when the mother, presumably distraught over her circumstances, abandons the baby at a designated safe location where there are people waiting to provide immediate care. This is usually a hospital, a fire station, or a church. We have designated safe abandonment locations because of safe haven laws, which were enacted in response to incidents in which women have abandoned babies at unsafe locations. You know, Places like public restrooms or trash receptacles where babies have died from injuries, exposure, starvation, and dehydration. Rather than use prosecution as a deterrent, like our society does with other crimes, legislators decided that they must provide women with a way to abandon their children without harming them. This is society's way of avoiding confronting the horrifying fact that some women are so cold and callous they would endanger their child in this manner rather than use any of their other options. Nobody wants to hold them accountable. Regardless, it seems like that covers all the bases. No woman with that many options becomes a single mother with custody of her child by any means other than her own choice. And uh, who takes financial responsibility for that choice? Hint, it's not her. We have entire systems set up to transfer the financial responsibility for the welfare of an unmarried mother's children from her to anyone but her. Child support as a concept is actually much older than its name. Similar standards trace back to old English poor laws. The government would charge citizens for providing aid to their poor family members. This was to pressure families into taking care of their own. It was all about reducing the government's financial burden. Today, collecting from the public isn't really about reducing the cost to the state. A mother can collect both child support and public assistance, all without having to hold a job herself. She can live on a variety of programs as long as she remains under the poverty level. It's not really about the welfare of the child, either. Research shows that non-custodial fathers pay their child support more consistently when they are allowed greater involvement in their children's lives. There's a dual benefit to this. Research also shows a broad spectrum of ways in which father involvement is of benefit to the child. Instead of using law and policy to protect father involvement, our government spends millions of dollars using force and coercion to collect support. They do this sometimes to the detriment of father involvement and sometimes even to the detriment of the father's ability to pay. Clearly, the imposition of authority is far more important than the child's welfare. This is extremely expensive to the public. A Congressional Research Service report headed up by Jeff Sessions identified 83 overlapping federal welfare programs that together made welfare spending the largest item in the U.S. federal budget. 
While not all of these involve assistance to single-parent households, most of them were created to address financial needs that result from childhood poverty that is itself a result of being raised in a single mother home. And I say single mother because not only are single fathers with custody rare, census data shows they're more likely to work and earn money to pay for their family's living expenses. Meanwhile, child support laws have created a debtor's prison system for fathers based on unfair standards and irrational penalties. As punishment for failing to pay enough support, a father's tools for earning income are stripped away in order to, uh, well, what exactly? When this does not help him pay more, he faces incarceration, where he will build up further child support debt, all at taxpayer expense. The cost to society doesn't stop there. Research shows that it's common for mothers to interfere with or deny fathers' time with their children. Women aren't even held responsible for this. A man can be alienated from his children by their mother and assigned an unpayable support obligation based on imputed income at her request and still get called a deadbeat who doesn't want to spend any time with them and won't pay his support. The mother gets to play the part of the poor, long-suffering victim who just doesn't understand his behavior. And the children? Oh yeah, the children. They'd been forgotten for a moment there. Research on father involvement tells us a lot. I've talked about this before. Research gathered from independent sources and compiled and evaluated by the Father Involvement Initiative shows numerous ways in which children benefit from involvement with their fathers. During the tender years, for instance, when the court considers them unimportant, a father's involvement leads to better ability to handle strange or stressful situations, better problem-solving ability, and better ability to relate to others. Kids with involved fathers perform better academically, show more involvement with their academic community, and have fewer discipline issues. They also have fewer social issues and are more likely to resolve them without seeking a teacher's assistance. Father involvement also makes kids less likely to go along with other children in making choices that will get them into trouble. As they get older, kids with involved fathers have better school attendance and are more likely to graduate. This trend continues through post-secondary education and is noted to affect career success and psychological well-being. This means they are less likely to end up in poverty and end up needing government financial aid. Kids of involved fathers grow up to be more tolerant of others and to be more likely to have successful marriages and long-term friendships. They're less likely to engage in self-destructive behaviors such as truancy, substance abuse, or criminal activity. They're less likely to end up in jail. They're less likely to become unwed parents. They're less likely to experience depression, anxiety issues, or risk of being abused. And they're less likely to commit suicide. Children raised in welfare-supported single-mother homes are more likely to grow up to be welfare-reliant single parents. That is, of course, at taxpayer expense, which means mostly at the expense of men. Men pay the overwhelming majority of taxes, while women receive the overwhelming majority of tax-funded economic benefits. The result is an escalating cycle of poverty and welfare dependence. According to ChildTrends.org, births outside of marriage in the U.S. increased from about 26% in 1990 to 40% in 2018. What is the trend going to be in welfare spending if that continues? How about the trend in child outcomes? How many fathers are getting thrown under the bus? Why does our society allow this to continue? The answer is this. Women have reproductive rights with little or no accompanying responsibility. Men have economic responsibilities as a result of women's reproductive rights with no legally protected reproductive rights of their own. That's a hell of a power imbalance. Tolerance for it comes at the cost of taxes paid mostly by men and of the futures of the children born into these circumstances. The impact on society is profound and disastrous, and it will not stop until equality of accountability is achieved. The question is, can that be done? I think it can.
It's not going to be easy, but the men's rights movement is already doing a big part of what needs to be done. Public awareness of the importance of father involvement helps to promote equally shared parenting laws. Equally shared parenting laws, which are becoming more and more the norm, help to promote father involvement after divorce and in single parenting situations. But even more, if mothers cannot so easily evict a father from his child's life and just use him for child support, they are less likely to initiate a divorce and therefore more likely to work at keeping their marriages alive. Since about 70% of divorces initiated by women, equally shared parenting laws could reduce the overall incidence of it. Less divorce means more fathers involved in their daughters' lives and more opportunity to instill that sense of accountability so many women today lack. It means more fathers involved in their sons' lives, able to raise them to hold the women in their lives to an equal standard. If a gender gap in accountability is the most basic underlying cause behind the issues faced by men and boys today, father involvement is the cure. It seems dads really are the ultimate experts in repair. I think that makes custody and child support reform the first step on the path of social change needed to support legislative reform where other men's issues are concerned. It also means that women who understand these issues are going to have to be very conspicuous advocates for father involvement, putting pressure on mothers to stop interfering in father-child relationships. Feminists will hate us for it, but the next generations will be glad we did it. <laughs>